All right, everyone, let's talk about cobalt chromium. We all know it, right? It's a true workhorse in orthopedics. It's incredibly strong, super resistant to corrosion. It's just a fantastic biomaterial. But that brings up a really interesting clinical question, one I'm sure many of us have thought about. If this stuff is so great, why is it completely missing from our fracture fixation sets? Let's dig into that. So let's start with this central paradox. We have a material with objectively superior strength, but you just don't see it when you're treating fractures. It's a bit of a clinical mystery. And this really is the core question, isn't it? I mean, we are trained to pick the strongest, most durable implant for the job. And yet when it comes to fracture plates, the entire industry has pretty much universally settled on titanium and stainless steel. Now, that's not by accident. It is a very deliberate decision, and it's rooted in some really fundamental biomechanics and, frankly, clinical common sense. And that leads us directly to the single most important reason, the biomechanical mismatch. This is really where those impressive material properties of cobalt chromium stop being an asset and actually become a major liability for the patient. Okay, now take a look at this chart. The numbers here tell a fascinating story. Look way down on the left. That's cortical bone, sitting around 20 gigapascals. Now, follow that all the way to the right to cobalt chromium at 230 GPA. We're talking more than 10 times stiffer. This isn't just a small difference. It's a massive biomechanical chasm. And that extreme, uncompromising rigidity is the real root of the entire problem. So that huge stiffness gap leads directly to a concept we're all very familiar with, stress shielding. The plate is just so incredibly stiff that it carries almost all of the physiologic load, basically building a protective shield over the bone. And you know, shielding might sound like a good thing, but in bone biology, it's absolutely pathological. Wolf's law, right? Bone needs that mechanical stress to stay healthy, to maintain its density, and to remodel properly. And this right here, this is the clinical cascade that inevitably follows. You have the super stiff plate, which shields the bone from load. That, in turn, causes cortical resorption right under the plate. The bone literally just melts away because it's not being asked to do any work. And the end result for our patient is the very thing we were trying to prevent in the first place a delayed union, or even worse, a frank non-union. You see, this gets to the very heart of modern fracture care. It's all about strain theory. We're not aiming for absolute concrete-like rigidity anymore. What we want is relative stability. We want a construct that's strong enough to hold the reduction, but just flexible enough to allow for that tiny bit of controlled micro-motion at the fracture site. That's what stimulates callus to form. An ultra-rigid cobalt chromium plate completely violates this fundamental principle of healing. So that's the mechanics of it. But beyond the pure physics, there are also some pretty significant biological consequences we have to think about. The completely rigid environment created by a cobalt chromium plate essentially forces the bone to heal through primary or direct bone healing. It actively suppresses the formation of that beautiful, fluffy healing callus that we love to see on x-ray. Now look, in a perfectly reduced, simple transverse fracture, maybe you could get away with that. But what about a highly comminuted fracture? That's exactly where you need that robust secondary healing response. Suppressing callus in that scenario is just detrimental. You absolutely need the load sharing and biological boost you get from titanium and steel. And then of course, there's the whole issue of biocompatibility. We know that these alloys release cobalt and chromium ions. We've all seen the literature from the metal on metal hip disaster, right? We're talking about local tissue toxicity, metal hypersensitivity, inflammatory reactions, even osteolysis. For a permanent implant like a hip replacement, you might argue that's a calculated risk. But for a fracture plate that's meant to be temporary, exposing a patient to that risk profile is just not justifiable. Okay, let's step away from the cell biology for a second and walk into the operating room. Let's think about the real world practical challenges. What if these plates were actually sitting on your back table? Well, the answer is simple, and it's definitive. They would be an absolute nightmare to contour. And honestly, from a surgeon's perspective, that factor alone makes them a complete non-starter. So why would they be so hard to work with? Well, it's those same material properties again. The extreme hardness and the very high yield strength when you'd need a ridiculous amount of force just to bend the plate. And even if you could bend it, the material has this significant spring back, meaning it won't hold the shape you just spent five minutes creating. Now just imagine trying to get a perfect anatomical fit on the complex, multiplanar surface of a pelvic fracture or a distal radius. It would be practically impossible. But it gets even worse. That incredible rigidity isn't just a practical hassle. 
it's fundamentally incompatible with our modern locking plate systems. It actually undermines the very engineering principle that makes them so effective. Let me walk you through the failure sequence. A normal titanium locking plate has a little bit of elastic give. It bends ever so slightly to share the load across the entire construct. A cobalt chromium plate, on the other hand, will not deform. It's too rigid. So all of that immense stress gets concentrated right at the screw plate junction. Every single time the patient takes a step, that interface gets hammered. This leads to high stress cyclical loading and eventually premature fatigue failure of the screw. The plate itself might be perfectly fine, but the construct will fail at its weakest link, the screws. So after going through all the reasons why cobalt chromium is the wrong choice for fracture plates, let's solve our initial paradox. Let's talk about where it is precisely the right material for the job. Because that incredible rigidity and its amazing wear resistance are exactly what we need in high demand, high load bearing situations. It's the perfect material for a femoral head in a total hip or for the femoral components in a total knee. You see it in some spinal implants and in dental work too. In these applications, you want minimal deformation and maximum longevity under articulation, the exact opposite of what a fracture plate needs to do. And that really brings us to the ultimate take home message, the core principle of this whole discussion. It's actually beautifully simple. Fracture plates need to be strong, yes, but they also have to be flexible. Cobalt chromium is incredibly strong, but it's just far, far too stiff. And that, in a nutshell, is why titanium and stainless steel continue to be our go to standards in trauma, while cobalt chromium serves its vital role in arthroplasty. It's all about using the right material for the right application.